Um, usually they start out these uh, parlor talks with Mr. Rodney Kent, and I want to remind everybody that we have cards out here. Mr. Rodney's not feeling so well, and so if you can write a little, you know, thinking of you or whatever, we have some cards out front there. So if you haven't done that before you leave today, you know, make sure you do that. Um, my name is Chris Yeomans, and I'm uh, I'm a Harkers Islander, and I tell people I'm I don't live on Harkers Island anymore. I'm more like a refugee. I live on the mainland. I, I you know, I, I go back to when I first, I taught school. So when I, when I was teaching, I was poor and I couldn't afford anything on the island. Now that I'm rich, <laughs> <laughs> and my house is paid for, it's just, you know, I think I'll stay right where I'm at. <laughs> but uh, I'm Chris Yeomans. I'm from uh, Harkers Island. I, uh, I taught uh, in Cardiff County for uh, for 10 years, uh, one year in, in Goldsboro in Wayne County, and then I was in administration for the rest of the time, and I retired in uh, 2018 with uh, 30 years. That was that was plenty of time. Uh, matter of fact, I met a guy. That my hair's kind of long right now, I, I know. And usually when it's real short, uh, I'll see somebody at the you know Walmart or grocery store, and they'll. They won't know if I get military discount, you know, or something like that. And, you know, I get confused that I'm retired military. And so I told somebody, I'm not retired military, but I'm retired school educator. And he still said, uh, thank you for your service. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so I, I, I appreciate it. You all are welcome. I, I did 30 years. That was enough. Um, today we're going to <clears throat> pay some uh, homage to uh, to the Fish House Lars and uh or liars, I guess you would say, and um, with uh, Sonny and uh, Williamson and Rodney and uh, Josiah Bailey, um, Captain Jim Willis. Uh, I never had the opportunity to meet Mr. Josiah Bailey, but I did meet Captain Jim. I took Rodney's Carter County History class, and if you've had the experience of taking that, it's a wonderful class. I don't know if he still does that at times, but uh, it was it was a while back I, I took that class and we traveled all over Carter County, you know, uh, to the sites and, and talked about different different things that way. So um, I kind of got um, I don't feel part of the liar community, <laughs> and I say that in a I feel more like a protege. And uh, when I was teaching school, my uh, my wife and I and, and we have a little. I say a little daughter. She's 27 now, <clears throat> but I had a little daughter at the time, and we'd go to the Cape a lot, you know. And locals would show up on the ocean side of Shackford or over there in front of the lighthouse, and and uh, I noticed this. Uh, I thought he was old at the time, <laughs> but this old man and his, you know, and I knew Mr. Sonny. I, you know, had had he had spoke to my classes and stuff a couple of times, but he, I noticed he was running these tours over to the Cape, you know. And they were the Mule Train Beach Tours. This is a this is my T-shirt that I donated one of my T-shirts to the museum that we used to wear over there. That was the year tie dye was our theme, and so every time a little kid got on one of our trucks, he used to give them cans of spray paint and let them have at it on the trucks. By the end of the year, our truck was fully painted. <laughs> you didn't know what color it was going to be. Even the tires got painted. It was great. So. Uh, so that was our year that we had uh, the tie dye stuff. But uh, I told him when I was over there, I said, you know, uh, teaching at the time, you have you know a couple months off during the summer. I said that would be a great time for me to, you know, if you need any help. Uh, so the, I think it was the next year, he and uh, Miss Jenny had kind of got a little busier, and uh, and uh, I started doing the doing the tours. Um, uh, I uh, today, and it was kind of unique today. Speaking of uh, Facebook, today I was uh, Facebook stalking and one of our memories come up of birthdays. I shared earlier down the way, but today, February 2nd, would have been Mr. Sonny's 89th birthday. He'd have been 89 today. Um, Just a kid. Born, yeah, I know. That's what I, you know, and I'm thinking, you know, when I worked for him, he was probably in his late 50s, early 60s, and uh, that's where I'm at now, you know, so uh, I. Yeah, I, I I look at that, you know. I remember one time I was talking to some folks, and it was a hot day. It was around the Fourth of July, and we was I was doing my group, and he was finishing his, and he was walking up, and he's uh, he's coming across that hot sand there right in front of the lighthouse, and now all those pine trees wasn't there now. And I'm looking at Mr. Heber there, that's now all grown up. It's kind of like a it looked like the Mojave Desert, or maybe uh 
maybe even like the Sahara Desert, you know. So as he was walking across and he had his sandals on, he had that beard, you can kind of picture it that the beard he had and his, you know, I think he had like a towel draped around his head. And I told him, I said, I'm, you know, Chris Yomas, I said, I teach history. I te taught history and social studies in Carter County. I said, I teach history and social studies. And as he was walking across, he was coming there and he looked like Moses. <laughs> and I said, I teach history. I said, that man right there, he is history. <laughs> and he was walking across with that sweat of God. And anyway, so, uh, so that was uh, Mr. Sonny. Uh, one, one time when I was, uh, if you want to call it working, Mr. Heber may call it working at times, but if you call it working, going over and, and telling uh, folklore stories and tales about the place we love and then getting paid for it, I don't know if that would consider work. But uh, they did pay us, and one, and one year or one week, he was selling, setting, settling up with me, and I said, Mr. Sonny, you know what I'd like? I said, I'd like to have a copy of all your books. I said, just pay me in books. So, uh, I, and I brought, brought all of those. You, you'll be more than welcome to look at some of them today if you would like. But, um, uh, and he has, uh, well, kind of unsung heroes of the surf. Uh, this is uh, a kind of kind of, you might say, pinpoints in on the Cape Lookout uh, life-saving station and the ships that they helped uh, rescue and save along the coast. Uh, that's that one. Um, he's got one, uh, Salt Spots for Breakfast. Huh? Nice. And this is, this is more of a, uh, you might say, the uh, kind of a stories of his life growing up. Um, recipes, Grandma's favorite crab recipes from the Crystal Coast. Uh, cooking with Grandma, uh, shipwrecks of Ocracoke Island, um, the <clears throat> sailing with Grandpa is uh, is stories about um, ships uh, around Cardiff County. Mr. Heber, you'd probably be uh, if you're not familiar with this, would be familiar with a lot of the a lot of the vessels they talk about in here, the owners, uh, the boat builders. And things of that nature, and of course he he wrote a little nice little, you know, to uh, little note to to me. Uh, he he we got asked a lot about the stories we would tell on our tour, and he he wrote one called the Lookout Adventure, uh, that was about our our tour and our, the stories that we would tell and the folk tales they would tell there. Um, He's got one here called uh, Jumping Mullets and Collard Greens. And he, and he, he writes in the uh, beginning of it that, you know, anytime that you wanted something that was good, he said that you couldn't beat, you know, Jumping Mullets and Collard Greens. He said because Jumping Mullets was always prevalent in Core Sound and Collard Greens was a hearty vegetable that always grew. Uh, even the frost would make it that much sweeter. So he, he wrote a book about this. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's more of... Uh, just some, again, more fish house liar stories and, and folklore from, from Cardiff County. Um, and then he obviously has one called, called Fish House Liars. And, and what I'd like to do is, uh, is read his uh, preface to you in this that kind of explains what the Fish House Liar was all about. So he, first of all, he says, uh, for Chris, Cardiff County's number two liar, all the best. Perhaps Rodney will be better in the future. <laughs> so I guess I was number two. He was number one. Rodney fell below me. So according to him that day in the book. Anyway, so don't tell Rodney I said that, let's say. Um, he writes here, says, Often the question is exactly what is a fish house liar? I am never fully prepared to answer, but I have been given a lot of thought lately, and the best I can come up with is that it is an individual who loves the rich history and storytelling heritage of the, uh, of the coastal region that he is willing to be stuck with the title of liar. The tales we tell as liars are the same stories which have been passed down verbally uh, from generation to generation. Over the years, they have been added to, modernized, changed until only the truth remains, uh, the true remain, remaining is that they are intended strictly for the entertainment and even uh, those uh, we sometimes poke fun at uh, is never done in malice. This is an important this is important to remember because that's what it's all about. 
just to have good, clean fun. Although I have known many tales of tall tales back when none of them refer, were referred to as liars, to, be the, be, to the best of my knowledge, the term fish house liar was coined by Captain Josiah Bailey <clears throat> back when there were several practicing tellers of tales, uh, dubious tales about Cardiff County. I first mentioned some of these uh, very individuals in my newspaper column when referring to the speakers at a gathering on Harkers Island where several of these raconteers, you use that big word in there, I had to look that up, matter of fact, <laughs> raconteers preceded me to the platform and proceeded to tell the very story I had planned, claiming that they were their own. I know this is true, once said because, one said because it happened to my grandfather. Although I really admit to, uh, to sometimes stretching a point to make a good story better, I have, I have never blamed my shortcomings on my saintly grandfather. <laughs> Nevertheless, the only word that I know bigger than mayonnaise, that, <laughs> there, there was, uh, was at one time several individuals who proudly, proclaimed, who proudly proclaimed to be Cardiff County's fish house liars. Two politicians went first. Below the dignity of their office, I was told, they, the statement alone would qualify them both. And I, and I think one of them, uh, and I got, I got a Mr. David Yeoman story, I think one of them was Mr. David Yeoman's. <laughs> so, uh, and, and if he, he would not have liked to be called a liar. No. He, was a, he was a strong Methodist. I'll tell you a little story about him in a little bit. So, but um, all right. Where am I at here? Okay. Then, the, then our beloved founder, found, uh, founder, Captain Josiah, passed on to his reward, leaving us uh, certainly no fault of his own. Next, we go to Captain Jim. He was too honest. Uh, we couldn't teach him to lie. Then James Allen bit the dust. He couldn't decide if he wanted to be a musician, a boat builder, or a liar. The money and boat building um, finally won out, which brings us... Uh, to Joel, and I'm assuming that's Mr. Joel Hancock. Uh, now, Joel is an honorable man and a fine storyteller, but to tell the truth, he was just too embarrassed to be seen in public with the rest of us. <laughs> Finally, Rodney and I were flabbergasted to learn that our favorite moderator, Squires Taylor, was a lawyer and therefore overqualified. I'm not... <laughs> This left just the two of us. Rodney is far too fine a gentleman to be involved in with off-color tales. So here I am in the raw without apologies, Sonny Williamson. <laughs> so that's a fish house liar, according to Sonny, <laughs> on his birthday today. Is that what the title of that book is? It is, yes, Fish House Liars. And it, and it goes through um, Sonny's, um, I guess his stories that he would tell uh, with him and Rodney, you know. Um, what I wanted to do today, and we were, uh, <clears throat> I was mentioning some of the, uh, um, some of the stories there, but uh, I, I got a list of, and these are the ones that, uh, I tried to pick the ones that I do the best. <laughs> and and like I said, some of these stories have been modified to, uh, to, uh, to match me and my personality, I guess you would say. Others, I, I tried to, uh, to stick with the tradition. I, I mentioned um, um, Mr. Davey Yeomans, and um, there's a story. First of all, Mr. Davey Yeomans told me one time, and, and these are stories that he told me. Uh, he told me one time that there was a, uh, he, he asked me, he said, he said um, there's something that myself, he said, uh, and President Abraham Lincoln both have in common. Gets your attention when you try to compare yourself to Mr. Abraham Lincoln. He said, Mr. Abraham Lincoln on his dying bed there after he got shot, you know, you know the story, said his mother was there to his side and he promised his mother, no, that's not true. See, I got, it was not at his dying bed, at his mother's dying bed. I hadn't told this story in a while. At his mother's dying, be, uh, dying bed when he was standing there, he told uh, his mother that he was going to live a true and, and, and faithful life, and he was not going to drink a drop of alcohol his entire life. And according to the records, Abraham Lincoln went his entire life and never drank anything. He said he became president of the United States. He said, 
my mother on her dying bed, he said, I shared with her that I was going to be true, never tell a lie. We were with the fish house liars, never tell a lie. And I was going to, uh, you know, never drink a drop the whole time, my entire life. He said, and I've stuck to that my entire life. You know, she's passed away and going, I've never drank a drop. He said, he became president of the United States. He said, I became president of the Methodist Men's Fellowship Group. <laughs> 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 that's right. That's right. That's close. Uh, another Davy Yeoman story is uh, this one, and this is uh, um, this is told several times. And, and what, if you really want to hear it told right, you need to hear. Uh, I call him Brother Bentley Brooks. You need to hear Brother Bentley Bentley Brooks tell the story. And if you think I talk with a little accent, Brother Bentley has a really nice accent, don't he, Mister Heber? Matter of fact, my daughter was in college, and um, she, her roommate uh, at East Carolina, one day they were talking, and she said, you know, sometimes I don't quite understand what your dad is saying because of his accent. This was me. So the next time I showed up at my daughter's apartment, I called Bentley on my cell phone and put him on speakerphone. <laughs> and we chatted a little bit. When we got through, I said, did you understand a word he said? They said, no, nope, not, not one word. <laughs> So uh, Brother Bentley tells this story, and, uh, and, and this is about Davy Yeomans also. And I've heard several people, you know, vouch that this is true. But there was, uh, there was two individuals on the island, and it was, um, it was um, um, Ricky Moore and a fellow, and I don't know his real name, Ricky Moore and Shadro. I don't know Shadro's real name, but it's Shadro. That's what they always call it. If you get a nickname on Harkins Island, you've really made it. I never got a nickname on Harkins Island. But, so Ricky Moore and Shadro are to the Easter down there where the Park Service is now. And this was way back when uh, Davy Yeomans was a county commissioner. They were to the Easter. And for some reason, with their shotguns, trying to shoot something, that's the way Harkins Islanders do. Look, if there's two like male and female redheads and they're the last two redhead ducks in the whole entire world, a Harkins Island would kill both of them. That's just the way they are. You know, so they were to the to the shell point. They're just shooting stuff like, and they end up shooting a pelican. And you know, shooting a pelican is like really bad. And they got caught shooting this pelican, this Ricky Moore and Shadro. So they have to go to court. So Davy Omens, you know, being kind of the mayor of Harkins Island and trying to, you know make sure everybody is look at, looked after. He says, I'll go there. I know the lawyer. I know the judges. I'll go there and try to help you out. So uh, Ricky Moore and Shadro are in the courtroom, and they're sitting in there, and the judge, he is adamant that he's going to make an example out of these young men from Harkins Island. I mean, they've shot a pelican. I mean, can you imagine? You know, so uh, Davey Yeomans goes up to him and says, Your Honor, you know, you just don't understand what you're dealing with. These boys you know, don't know any better, you know, just take it easy on them. You know, they, they just really, you know, just kind of to their own devices and they got in trouble and they won't do it no more. I'll talk to them. He said, nope, I'm going to make an example out of them. I'm going to lower the book on them. I'm just going to, you know, so directly he looks at it and says, <clears throat> here's what I'm going to do. He said, 30 days in jail or $10,000. I know. Ricky Moore looked at Shadrow and said, I don't know about you, pal, pal, but I'm going to take that $10,000. Supposed to be a true story. Hey, wouldn't you take the $10,000? <laughs> so the judge looked at, uh, looked, looked at Davey Hummel and said, case dismissed. Getting him out of here. <laughs> Getting him out of here, taking him back home. I don't know about you, Pow Pow, but I'm taking that $10,000. Did you tell about the termites? I had forgot about that story, but I will tell that. Yeah, I do. another Dave Yeoman story. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll probably get something. He could tell it much better because obviously he, true, I mean, these stories are true. Like I said, we're, I, I take a little, and I think, uh, you know, when I say fish house liar, I'll go back to Sonny, and I was going to mention this earlier. I think Sonny gets a bad rap, and we're going to talk about him. I know he's going on to his maker, but we're going to talk about Sonny a little bit. <laughs> I think Sonny gets a bad rap because every time we, every time somebody mentioned a story that Sonny told, they would always talk about it being a lie. And and I'm telling you, there's a lot of truth. You had to kind of filter out some of the pieces there. But there was a lot of truth in everything that he did. 
there's a, I mean, there's a lot of research went into these books. I'm going to tell you, if these, if you look at them and the dates and, you know, think, you know, it's a, a lot of stuff there. Uh, uh, I saw where Mr. Red Daniels had passed away. I, I saw that. I mean, this is just this week. Yeah. Um, his, I want to say it was his daddy, Arlie Daniels. There, there's a, a write up in there of Arlie, Ar, Arlie Daniels, his daddy, telling about the, each family on Cedar Island after the 33 storm. I mean, this is, you know, documented that Sonny took the time to interview Mr. Arley back in the day and, and write that down. That's pretty cool. So anyway, uh, you know, fish house liars, I take a little bit of offense to being called a liar. <laughs> <laughs> These are true stories. We might just embellish them a little bit. So but fish house liar. Fish house that's liar. Right. That's the difference. Yeah. So, uh, David tells a story one time. He 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 and Miss Clarimathelda had a, a uh, if you want to call it a camp to the Cape, they had a camp to the Cape. I wouldn't call it a camp to the Cape. It was their second home. I, you might even refer it to it as their first home. Most of the time, when I did the mule train tours, it was and I, I tried to explain to the the people on the back of the truck or the trailer. I said, "You're in a treat for a treat today," because you know David, Mr. David, and Miss Clarimathelda are at the house. And I'd always stop by and he'd always come out there and, and chat with them and stuff. You know, he had a little hand pump in front of his place there. And he always called that the fountain of youth, which <laughs> I, I don't see why it wouldn't be the fountain of youth now. He said it was only about six foot deep, which is another story there. Over at the Cape, and uh, you know, there's got to be fresh water somewhere because there's green stuff growing there. I mean, think about it. I'm not a scientist, but that, and the salt water, what scientists tell us, it pushes that fresh water to the surface on those barrier islands. So if you drill your you know, pump too deep, you hit salt water. So that's why it's real shallow. So he said his, his well was only about six foot deep. Anyway, if you go over there now and take Mr. Heber's tour, it is the old life-saving station boathouse, which is now back to its original, um, you might say, uh, condition as it was at the U.S. life-saving station. But um, uh, Mr. David, I know I'm going off track here, but I'll get back to you. Mr. David told me he bought it at Surplus and moved it down on his property. Yes, he owned property there. It was it was like 12 and a half acres, and his, I want to say, grandfather had bought it for like 13 and a half cent an acre over at the Cape. Can you imagine what that property is worth today? It's crazy, isn't it? But uh, he said he moved it on his property. It was getting late that night, and he was sitting right in the middle of the road, and they were tired. He said, so instead of moving the house back on the property, they just moved the road. <laughs> <laughs> so the road goes in front, pretty close to the house. If you notice, it goes right in front there. And over, over the years, I guess, people got used to, we won't run in the house. We'll just, you know, kind of detour around it and move in front of the road. <laughs> so, but Mr. David, Mr. Kyle Thelma was staying over there. He said, and one night they were riding around, uh, you know, I think three wheelers at the time. If you remember, those were the big reds. Man, they were oh, nice. Yeah, you know, yeah Honda. They were riding around on their three-wheelers at night, and they saw a mama loggerhead turtle come up and lay her eggs. And if you know anything about mama loggerhead turtles, about 350 pounds. I think they lay up to like a 110 or so egg, 115, 120 eggs a, a, a nest in time. And then, like I used to tell them, they go to cover their hole up and swim off into the ocean, and mama hood is over. That's it. They're done. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> I used to tell them that, you know, mama had a turtle, because there was always those PVC pipes. They're still probably over there that, you know, that mark where the turtle nests are after the park service go by. And so I would tell the tourists on my tour there, I said, hey, mama turtles, put two PVC pipe under each flipper. <laughs> and they come up there. <laughs> and they kind of look at me like, see, you got the, the lie and the truth or somewhere. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Mr. Davis said he saw them lay that evening. He said, and uh, I guess the wind blew that night and whatever. And they, so the, the next morning when the Park Service people came by and they had some folks from, uh, little interns from Duke University, the, the, the Marine, and they were looking for those turtle eggs. They saw the tracks, but they didn't know exactly where the turtle had gotten and, and, and made her nest. And he had uh, seen it before and he had actually marked it with a little stick, he said. So he knew about where it was. And he said, he got down on all fours. You can see Mr. David doing it. He's a little short guy, you know. He got down on all fours and started acting like he was smelling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he, said, he said, he'll try right there. 
you know, sure enough, they dug up, you know, that was them eggs. He said it was years later, said people would come by from Duke University wanting to know where that old man that could smell turtle eggs was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who would have thought of doing that, something like that? Yeah. <laughs> Didn't tell him no different. Was that lying? I mean, no, it wasn't lying. <laughs> Mr. David, yeah, that was good. That was good. Thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. <clears throat> I got. I, I don't know which direction I want to go, but I, I'd like to tell this one because this is this happened uh, at the Cape, and this is uh, one of the. This is where this is a true story. <laughs> I used to tell people on this tour. This is a true story. <laughs> <laughs> this is a true story, <laughs> and, and I, I do like to tell this because uh, it was the only uh, that was a U.S. life saving service over there in. I think it was 1887. It was de it was uh, decided that the United States Life and Sur Saving Service would be developed over at Cape Lookout, and there was there was a station there. And um, and on February 9th, 1905, a ship by the name of the Sarah D. J. Rawson ran aground on the Cape. February 9th, 1905. She left Charleston on February 2nd and was sailing up to New York with lumber. So you kind of you kind of picture the sailing vessel going. She ran, uh, you know, high and dry, about nine miles off of Cape Lookout, in a uh, strong southwest wind, and it was foggy. So it wasn't until three or four hours later. The details are more in the book there, but three or four hours later, that the park, the, the park service, the uh, the the station, the uh, United States. Uh, Coast Guard, or he wasn't Coast Guard at the time, Life Saving Station actually saw the, the ship. Well, uh, in 1905, um, we had an uh, influenza pandemic going through the United States. Uh, if you go back to history, COVID was not the first pandemic we've had, if you go back in history. The Spanish flu, they called it, since it started in Spain. Okay, And, uh, <clears throat> and influenza was, was ravaging the life-saving station at the time. But like good life-saving men they are, once they realized those men in distress, they got in their life-saving boat, um, I think it was seven of them, and rowed out nine miles out to the, to the boat, okay? The waves were so, when the boat ran hard, hard aground, one guy got washed overboard. It was seven crew members on the, on the boat, and uh, this Norwegian sailor got washed overboard. And if you think about it, you know, here's this guy from Norway working on this merchant vessel off of Cape Lookout, you know, trying to provide for his family, and he gets washed overboard, never be seen again. So, it, you know, trying to put that human, you know, aspect to it. But they, they row out there. They're sick now with the flu in their dories, if you can kind of picture these seagoing dories they rode out there. Um, the, it was so rough they couldn't get to the boat. And, and in Sonny's book here, it, it, it's got the uh, uh, Captain William Howard Gaskell was the life-saving service, uh, you know, might say captain or, or super, keeper. superintendent. Keeper. keeper, yeah. And, uh, and he, wrote, he wrote it up in his report to, uh, to uh, his superiors. But uh, they decided to stay there that night with the ship just in case Men got washed overboard, whatever. So they anchored up a few hundred yards from the boat. They're waiting for, you know, they're they're fending off debris, lumber. I mentioned about the boat uh, laden with lumber. Lumber's uh, uh, tossing to and fro in these waves. If you go to Cape Cape Point and how the point makes out there, waves are coming from all sides. And if you can kind of picture this in a in a in a good day, it's bad. <laughs> In a bad day, it's real bad. <laughs> it's terrible. So if you can kind of picture all these, you know, two befores, and I, I, I picture like 16-footers and four by sixes and, you know, all just pitching and pulling everywhere, and they're fending off their boat because they, you know, they're the lifesaver folks. They don't want to be, you know, in distress either. Uh, the next morning and evening, they decided by the time that the tide shifted that maybe the wind would shift, and sometimes... If you, some of y'all that spend the time on the on the water, that wind and tide works together. Sometimes when the tide slacks off, the wind will fall right out, and then when the tide starts picking up, the wind will start picking up. And and uh, the uh, 
Uh, Mr. Gaskell was, was correct in that assessment, and they were able to get close enough to the boat that they sent out a, a line to the boat. Um, you know, the folks got in the ring, tied it around, and they pulled all the, the six remaining crewmen off the boat as it was continuing to break apart on the shoals. Um, they stayed out there for a total of 28 hours. The men on the boat was out there for 45 hours. 45 hours on the boat, no food, no water. The other men fighting the flu on the boat for 28 hours, saved these six crewmen, got them back to shore, and uh, you know, fed and clothed them. I like to tell that because they were the only crew at, the, uh, at Cape Lookout National Seashore or the life-saving station to receive the gold life-saving medal of honor, okay? And one of them, and, and I, I'm not sure if it was the same one, but one of them on the list here was Mr. Kib Guthrie. Yeah. Promised Land Kib Guthrie? I don't know. I'm just throwing that out. There's a David C. Guthrie, too, from over here. Okay, so I, well, that was one of them. And then, then another one that I always tried to throw in there is a Mr. Walter M. Yeomans which have some branches to do with my lineage. So, so I like to tell that story. So that, that's a true story. <laughs> you know, Sarah D.J. Rawson. You just need to make him your granddad. Make him my granddad. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Isn't, he, isn't that Harold Hughes' father? I think so. Yeah. 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 Yeah
165 feet tall. It's about 32 feet and some odd on the, on the bottom. And it goes up to about 13 feet, two inches at the top. And the, and the, um, the uh, uh, plans of it shows that there's an inner wall and an outer wall of this lighthouse. And the, between the two walls, they filled it with washed beach sand. Why they washed it, I don't know. But whatever, it, whatever they did to it, it's worked since November 1st, 1859 when this lighthouse first shone its first light, okay? Well, in uh, November 1st, 1859, you know, we had a problem, and there were two lighthouses in the area, two lighthouses. I mean, you had this little stumpy one not too far away. There's, there's residence, uh, residue of it where it existed now that you can kind of see over there, right close to this other lighthouse. So blowing it up was not an option, okay? Because, you know, close, close proximity to this lighthouse. So uh, they got some people from off. And when I, used, when I used to tell my story from off, they were like, where's that from? I said, well, I think the term came from off is people who lived off the island. So if you were from off, you were from off. <laughs> you, weren't you weren't on. Yeah, you were from off. So these people from off, real smart people from off, they came and, uh, and kind of figured out that they could take these strategic brick out right along the edge of that lighthouse so they you know kind of like uh, the domino effect i guess you would say and when they got to that last brick they were going to pull it out and then the lighthouse was crumbled well when they got to that last brick they were kind of trying to decide now locals are watching all this happen at the time you know they're trying to decide who's going to pull that last brick out because the lighthouse is going to come down i mean you know and and, and somebody's going to have to get out of there pretty quick so <clears throat> Uncle Billy Hancock and uh, Rosie Griffith. I've not done the, uh, and of course you know how, if you've done anything in the gene genealogy, you know how, you know, if you're here, you know how those fingers just get really wide <laughs> and you end up being kin to everybody? You know what I'm talking about? Well, uh, Uncle Billy Hancock, which is some of Joel's crowd, if you go through there, and Charlie Hancock, that, that Hancock crowd, um, according to Miss Rosie, was my great, 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 great grandfather. So, and he probably was. <laughs> we'll say he was anyway. So, uh, Miss Rosie did the tours with me. So, my great, 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 great grandfather, Uncle Billy Hancock, they said, and if you didn't believe it, you could ask him, was the fastest man in Cardiff County. He would have told you probably he was the fastest man in the world. Okay. And they told this story, and people laugh when I say it, but they told this to be true now. They said when he would go, and, it, and it, a P-O-N-D a P -O -N -D on Harkers Island is a pawn. Okay, you with me, right? P-O-N-D is a pawn. He would go to a pawn full of ducks, and he would sneak down the right by them, and before they could jump out and get out of the way, he would run out there and grab them in the air. That's what they said. Now, see, you laugh. Why do you laugh? It's true. <laughs> he said if you wanted a shack of her banks pony and look i mean even today they're pretty tame i mean you could probably walk right up to one right now i would advise against it first of all you get in trouble the park service getting real mad with you secondly a um, little sidebar here but back in the day when i was a little young fellow we used to have horse pennons every fourth of july Mr. Even you remember horse pennants. And, and they would take us young people out, and when they just put, I think they did it for the fun of it. They put us off, off to the end of Shackford and one group off to the, the west end of Shackford. And we would walk and meet in the middle. We'd be lined up across the, across the banks and herding them horses. I guess they didn't have, you know, horses themselves like the, you know, people in the west, so they used us youngers. And, they, and we would walk and, and corral those horses in those horse pens. And I remember one time, it, I you know, the name kind of slips from my mind because, you know, they were old. But I think he had had a right many in adult beverage at the time. But he decided that he was going to ride one of those horses. And I remember him getting in that pen. And nobody tried to stop him. I guess they were going to teach him a lesson. And when that, uh, you know, horse got stern too, you know what the stern is, don't you? When he got stern too, that man, and he reared up and kicked him with both feet right in the chest. That, no pun intended. That memory is impressed <laughs> right in my mind. <laughs> and I can see him as he flies across that, <laughs> right across that uh, corral, that pen. So anyway, but back to Uncle Billy. Uncle Billy, for just a few dollars, would run you down one of those shack of ponies. They said he was that fast. So some of the locals, as they watched these people from off looking at the lighthouse, 
you know, here's this nice, pretty tall structure that they've, you know, built, and then this is a little stumpy thing that now the bottom is missing except that one brick. They said, look, we could probably, you know, get up with Uncle Billy, and he could probably help you out, you know. So Uncle Billy said he wasn't going to be cheap, that he was going to charge them $5. <laughs> so you can kind of picture the scene, you know. Folks have gathered, you know, there's clam bakes, oyster roast, pig picking. They're probably uh, charcoaling some mullets. First of all, they want to see this stumpy of a lighthouse fall down. I mean, hey, who didn't want to come see the lighthouse fall, right? If the truth was really known, they were there because they went to see just how fast Uncle Billy was. So you can kind of see the crowd start parting as Uncle Billy walks up to the shore there. He's dragging that piece of mall behind him there with, you know, <clears throat> as he's going to like knock that brick out and turn around, you know. And he gets up there toward the edge of that base of that lighthouse and he gets his feet all set on him, you know, little drum roll, you know, and he's there and he kind of takes a couple practice swings. And when he swings, he knocks that brick out, throws that mall to the side just like he's practiced. And when he turns to run, he slips on all four right in front of that crumbling lighthouse. Oops. Well, the story now shifts a little bit to uh, Mr. Cleveland Davis's place there on Harkers Island. It was the beehive, the beehive. The mail would come from the mail boat. There was a fish, fish house too. People would go there to, uh, to get the news. And a couple of men that decided to work that day in the water and, and didn't see how fast Uncle Billy was or how fast he could run was just kind of sitting on the edge of their seats, just kind of like you are now, just wondering what the next line is going to be. And they said, how fast was he? How fast could he run? And the fellow telling the story says, I don't reckon know how fast he could run, but he could crawl about 35 mile an hour. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> Most of it. <laughs> so I tell that in memory of Sonny. Sonny would be proud. So I've heard him do that one many a time, and I, I tried to try to mimic him. I looked at myself the other day, and I got this white beard there. I didn't quite have it at the time when Sonny was around. And I look, I look more like Sonny as the days go by. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. I went to see... I went to see Miss Jenny uh, one time bef before she passed, and uh, of course she was dealing with some Alzheimer's and things. And uh, and uh, Kevin was there, their youngest son, and and she was. Uh, I just said, Miss Jenny, I said I had to stop by here because I, I thought I looked like Sonny, <laughs> and I went to see if you agreed. And she, at the time, she was feeling a little bit better. She said, No, you're okay. You're not quite as pretty as Sonny was, but you're all right. You're doing okay. So anyway, that was Uncle Billy. Oh, we got loads of time. <clears throat> this is a true story. <laughs> Have I started out with that one before? <laughs> this is really a true story. <laughs> uh, when I was in graduate school, and see, like I told you, some of these stories are mine. I, you know, only, only I, well, other people could tell them. I guess I could steal them. But uh, this, when I was in graduate school trying to learn to be a, a principal, uh, I remember going and taking that uh, principal exam. It was three two-hour sessions. If, if, if my math is done right, that's six hours with breaks in between. And after I walked out, I said, phew, I really feel like a principal now. <laughs> I was being a little facetious there, but when a group of us that were in our cohort uh, with East Carolina, we decided we were going to stay to the Cape one, one weekend, and we actually ended up staying over at the Coast Guard Station. I don't know how we got access to it, but we stayed upstairs in the Coast Guard Station right there. I remember it, uh, it rained that night, and it rained in the window on me, and I thought it was the greatest thing ever was. You wake up with rain, rain in your face at the Cape. Yep. How cool is that? So anyway, that night we decided we're going to ride down on our three-wheelers, four-wheelers at the time. I think three-wheelers had met, met their demise. We had four-wheelers. We're going to ride down on our four-wheelers, and we're going to look for turtles coming up. You know, this is July, August, and uh, Miss, uh, uh, I should have wrote her name down here, Mary Sue Davis. I'm looking over there, and Miss Mary Sue, uh, Miss Mary Sue Davis was over there. They had a if you want to call it camp, they had a second home over there just down 
the way from where David's place was. And they had a little house over there. So this Miss Mary Sue was over there. And she was kind of, to us, she was kind of like the matriarch that was always over there. If you always wanted a pot of something good to eat, she, was, she had it at her place there. She would always cook for you and stuff. Just a nice lady. Um, uh, Jack DeWayne's mama, Miss, uh, little, uh, I say little Jack, he's, he's bigger than I am, but you know, that's her younger son there, you know, and, uh, and Faith is Faith's her daughter, Lisa. Anyway, so that she was over there. So, and we, we find a, a one of the turtles coming up and I, I mean that year, I mean, it was just a, a banner year that they had like loads of loggerhead turtles coming up. And at the time, there was a group over there, some of the scientist folks, led by Mr. Keith Rittmaster. Some of you all know Mr. Keith Rittmaster. He does a lot with, uh, at the time, he was working with the Maritime Museum. He does, uh, he, and he had a, a group over there. And so as we're standing there, and, and, and once, if you, if you know anything about the, the turtle thing, and I did this one, one year when Sonny was there, he, would, he, would, uh, he asked me one night, he said, look, now, I'm telling you, he said, for $100, would you go over there one night and do like a little turtle thing? You know, let the folks see turtles because a lot of people want to know about turtles. And most of the time, you know, have to see them at nighttime. They don't come up during the day. So, uh, so I, I had done that previously and, and carried some folks that year because it was so many. I would be three or four every night come up. So as we were there, and, 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 uh, but once she comes up, you kind of had to let her, let mama do her thing. I mean, you know, when mama has, is, is ready, you don't mess with mama. Ain't that right? I don't know why I looked over there, but <laughs> <laughs> you just don't mess with mama. But when mama starts, hey, you can go over there and, and, and get close to her. So once mama starts, digs her hole, looks like a post hole digger is dug right there. Digs her hole, starts laying her eggs. You can go right up there to her and get kind of close. You know, don't get too close, but you know, mama's rolling and she, she can't be stopped. So anyway, we were close to her and Mr. Keith Rittmaster is over to my left. You kind of kind of picture this scene now. He's over to my left talking to these uh, young college, you know, educated folk about turtle conservation and, you know, things of that nature and, and, and how endangered they are and things of, you know, whatever. And then over to my right, Miss Mary Sue Davis is standing there with some of our folks and she's sharing turtle recipes. <laughs> and you just, you just had to be there. I was kind of in the middle of the two and you know, just kind of hearing both sides at the same time. It was, uh, it was, it was, it was fascinating. I don't know though, I'm trying to come up with a, a good word for that, but ironic. I told, uh, I would do my tours and when I come out from the, from the lighthouse, I'd always go down the beach and you'd always see those PVC pipes, you know. Of course, I'd, you know, turn around to everybody and say, oh, I, I see one. And they're looking, they're looking. I said, well, the PVC pipes, Mark, that's pretty easy. You know, but anyway, I would tell that story about, you know, folks eating turtles. And I said, and of course, that some of them from off, you know, would kind of turn their nose up to it or say, how dare they or whatever. I said, look, you got to understand, you know, when the children of Israel wandered around in the desert for 40 years, Jesus Christ fed him, didn't they? Manna from heaven, you know, uh, uh, water out of the rock. I said, this was like manna from heaven. I said, when a turtle, you know, got stunned or, you know, uh, summertime, I, I'd hate to, you know, cut mama's throat when she's on the way out. But if you happen to catch one in, in your net or whatever, that was, I remember uh, Mr., uh, was it Mr. Ari Lewis? Ari. No, it wasn't Ari. Mr. Louie. Louie. Yeah. Mr. Louie Gussie cut hair. Mr. Louie lived right by Grandma Myrtle house, and I remember him out there cleaning one one day when I was a little boy. Had him upside down, cutting all the meat out, and was gonna gonna stew him up. So, how about the eggs? I've, too. I've never. I start saying I've never heard of the eating the eggs, but there you go. Living over at the Cape, and you've got to think about it, over at the Cape with Diamond City, no roads, no access to the outside. I mean. Even my mom and dad now talk about going to town, and going to town back in the day was going to Beaufort, and you went by boat or mail boat or some, you know, you hitched a ride, and that's where you did your trading for goods and services and went back. You know, it was it's funny because Rodney even tells this. You know, down these people they talk about going to town. Now it kind of it's kind of mingled in with Moorhead, but you know, back the old timers would talk about town. That's Beaufort, and then if they talked about Moorhead, they're going to Walmart. <laughs> They don't say Moorhead. <laughs> I still call sliced bread time bread. 
Okay. We didn't get it home. We yeah. just had the AZ store. Right. We get loaf bread. Yeah. And we always call, call it, it town bread. bread. There you go. So. So the hot way, when I get a biscuit one, I say yeah. I want it from town bread. Town bread. They know, it's they know what you want. I'm him about it. There you go. Good. That's nice. All right. Anything else about turtles? When I was principal to Atlantic, I shouldn't tell this. Is this a lot? This is not a lot. <laughs> this is a true uh, story. Miss, uh, Miss Anna Gray. I can talk, talk about her now because she's passed away and going to her. Miss Anna Gray and, uh, and, and Miss Helen, Granny Helen, which is uh, uh, Adrian Nelson's yeah. grandmama. You know what I'm talking about. Uh, they were our foster grandparents at Atlantic. Two nice, wonderful ladies. Miss Anna, Miss Anna Gray, though, she, was, she could be a little feisty there. She came to me one day and she said, Miss Yeomans, I got you something for lunch. Don't ask me what it is and don't ask me where I got it from. <laughs> I think I know what it was and since we just had that conversation. <laughs> it was good too, I'll just tell you. <laughs> you know, as, as, and I, this is a true story. As young boys, we used to, you know, obviously, I mean, the thing you want it from, and I think about that, uh, is it the Christmas story where the guy, the little boy wants the Red Rider BB gun? He does, you know, hey, that's what, we wanted a BB gun. I mean, that, you had made it if you'd got a BB gun. And we would, I mean, that's what, we'd hide him in the woods, go to school, and then after school, you'd go try to shoot Robins and TTs, Cedar Waxwings. came out with a pump, they were strong. Yeah. I, I got one, model 25. I don't know why. But <laughs> I'm gonna make a long story short here, but uh, <clears throat> I got in trouble in Wilmington with that Model 25 BB gun shooting robins out of people's yards. <laughs> Wait a minute, you were a college boy. Hey, they were still good. <laughs> you got to understand, uh, it was a Cedar Islander, no, Harker's Islander, two Cedar Islanders, and an Otwayer room together. <laughs> Just kind of picture that. I graduated. Well, we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Camera back there. But my wife and I, when we first got married, we lived out of Williston. And one, one evening, I got just got, you might as well say, I got a hankering for some robins. And so I go out in the yard with a shotgun and shoot about six flying over the house that day. Pulled her little breast out, fry them up real pretty, get me some biscuits and some, uh, some peas. And she looked at me, she said, you will never go hungry, will you? I said, no, no I will not. Anyway, uh, I, I, we're, we got about four minutes. I got, uh, let's see here. Hmm, interesting. This is, uh, I think I will go there. I, I, I haven't. <clears throat> My daughter had to write a story one time, a local folk story, and she still got the story to this time. This is a true story. I know I've started all of them. <laughs> I've started all my stories like this. But I need this, and we mentioned Mr. Mr. Louie there, but, uh, and, and he's partially in this story, but this is Grandma Myrtle and the possum. And Grandma Myrtle uh, was a unique person. I mean, some of you all that remember Grandma Myrtle growing up, my grandmother, um, she, uh, she started one of the churches on the island, and I think, I think there's still eight. And I, I look at Mr. Heber, I think there's still eight. eight. And, I, and I say this affectionately, if anybody on Harkins Island goes to hell, it's their own fault. <laughs> There's eight churches on Harkins Island. I mean, and my grandmother started one, the Refuge Fellowship Church. Mm -hmm. that a question on I, that's what I heard one time. In the smallest, <laughs> smallest square footage or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it was Harkins Island was the, was the church, the area with the most churches per square mile. You know, it's about a mile long, four miles wide island. There are eight churches. Hmm. Anyway, my grandmother started one. In 1967, her husband died, Donnie Yeomans, my granddaddy, and she always wore black from that day forward for Donnie Yeomans. I remember my grandmother wearing black for Donnie Yeomans. She also, the next, uh, you might say, person that worked that walked the face of the earth that she, that she really loved was Jesus Christ. So she wore white for Jesus Christ and black for Donnie for your entire life. If you saw grandma, am I lying? She wore black and or white at times. Uh, uh, we would go out in the boat. If she went clamming, she had a white, white and or black frock on. I saw frock, you know what frocks are, right? Yeah, and we'd go out 
clam. And I remember this one boat went by one time and they said, she had a black frock on that day with a big old hat. And she's out on the shoal clamming. Can you imagine? And this boat's riding by. <clears throat> he says, there's a witch out there. <laughs> and Manly Jr., I got to tell this story about, because he's the preacher right now. He looked to see if Grandma was looking, then he gave him the finger. <laughs> anyway, that's my, that's my, that was Grandma. She was, uh, she was a unique person. Uh, she, she grew up, she was born on Diamond City. She moved over to Harpers Island uh, in uh, 1920. So she was about, I think she always told me she was nine years old. So she was born in 1911. She moved to on Harpers Island when she was 1920. Anyway, she lived in a house right across from Rosita, and there's a, still an oak tree there. Uh, and the house was right in front of that oak tree, between the oak tree and the road. And if you look where the road is, and I remember the, the house because when I was a little boy, we lived there and we used to go there. But you would walk out on the steps. The sidewalk had, had to be no more than five feet and then the road. I mean, you were right there on the road. So anyway, but if you, the old timey houses, if you remember those old timey houses, they didn't have no boxing around the eaves. The eaves were, were opened up for ventilation purposes. You didn't have air conditioning. You didn't, you know, you, you had some kind of heat. And I remember grandma's house, and most houses were built this way. In the center of the house, you had a center room, and that was where the heat was. And then you had rooms built off from it. And that was where the heat was. So, and, and they had added on to and so. so uh, granddaddy had died. Grandma was living there by herself, so on and so forth. And that oak tree that's still there, the edge of that limb would kind of hang on the roof, okay? And a family of possums, we didn't know how many at the time, but we realized a family of possums got overhead in Grandma's house, okay? And this was before cell phone time or thing. We had cell landlines, but, you know, and you would stay in Grandma's house at night and the pitter-patter, kind of like this ceiling here, sheetrock, the pitter-patter of little feet would be on that sheetrock. And so... Grandma, not being deterred by the possums, decided she was going to, the possums was not going to get the best of her. And the more they pitter-pattered and aggravated her, the more Grandma got more determined to get rid of those possums. So uh, one night, uh, as she's uh, laying there in bed, she hears one of those possums fall between the walls. And if you know what I'm talking about when I say between the walls, you know, you got your sheetrock here, you got your outer wall, and then you got two befores Usually, if it's built correctly, it's 16-foot centers. And in the, in, in the interior walls had no insulation. So that possum had, was walking around on the uh, top rafters and whatever and had fallen been between those two walls. And she could hear it down there, and it couldn't get out, and it was a scratch and a mess. And so Grandma, I had to get out your friend. Grandma, with an ice pick, you all remember what an ice pick is? This is before your ice machine, you know. Now, now you go up to the ice dispenser and, you know. But Grandma with her ice pick. And gently into the possum. She's thinking her problems are solved. Possum's gone, right? She cuts a hole. I remember going there. She cuts a hole, pulls the possum out. Grandma's tough, I'm telling you. Possum is not going to deter her. She pulls that possum out, out into the, you know, wherever the dead possums go in grandma's house. It may have gone into that evening stew. <laughs> so anyway, never, possums going, right? Problem solved. Next night, pitter patter on the roof of the... She just killed a possum. How many's up there? Pitter patter on the ceiling. Pitter patter on the ceiling. Pitter patter on the ceiling. Miss May Scott, which is... Uh, Lionel Scott's mother, you remember Miss May, a little white hair, I can see her now. She'd come out of church, come out of church, she'd sit there. Her and Miss May is sitting there having coffee. Grandma loved coffee. Matter of fact, us children, you ever eat soaked bread? Soaked bread and coffee? That's what she used to feed us. You take, take your, what'd you call it, town bread? bread? Take town bread, break it up, put it in your coffee, feed it to the younger with a spoon. <laughs> Soak bread. Yeah. Soak bread and coffee. Hey, sugar. And sugar was fresh. I remember this. Grandma would keep me and my mother would send me in packages of Kool-Aid, you know. Well, you know how much sugar it takes for a quart of Kool-Aid. Gee, forever. So grandma, I said, Grandma, you need to mix some Kool-Aid. So she mixed that up, that quart thing, and then I, 
She took one spoonful of sugar. She said, that's enough. <laughs> I didn't drink that. It wasn't good. <laughs> anyway, pitter-patter's going. Her and Miss Mayer are sitting around having coffee. She takes a broom handle, goes there to her ceiling. Ugh. Goes there to her ceiling. Ugh. Ugh. Trying to get that possum. She shoves holes the size of a broom handle all in her kitchen ceiling trying to get that possum. She is, I mean, she is adamant that that possum is not going to get the best of her. No possum that night. So later on, same, Miss, her and Miss May sitting there, and they're sitting there, and she looked, and right there in one of those holes, the possum tail fell through. You know what the possum tail looks like, right? Would you want to grab that thing? Grandma says, Miss May, hold that stool. <laughs> I'm going to get that possum. So Miss May's holding a stool. She climbs up on there and she grabs hold of that possum tail. You can only imagine what that possum did. Oh, all Hades broke loose. That possum's going crazy. And she's holding on that tail for dear life. And she looks at Miss May. She says, Miss May, get me a knife. <laughs> Before Miss May can get back with the knife, the possum slips loose. It's gone. Later on, later on. So she calls daddy. My dad is her middle child. She had uh, uh, Uncle Gene. Uncle Gene's the oldest. He passed away just last June. Yeah, 80 years old. He had Uncle Gene. He had uh, Daddy. My dad is Tommy Yeomans. And then she had a daughter, Cinda. I just saw her at Food Line, matter of fact. She said, it's the coldest time I got to go home. That's what she said. <laughs> so I just saw her. So, uh, and so Daddy set a trap, one of them nice rat traps up there. And sure enough, later on that night, she calls him on the old landline, says, Tommy, something's in that trap because it's, you know, all Hades is breaking loose again. Just the greatest commotion. So he goes there. He's still got the 22 pistol that my granddaddy used to run a store on the island. Her, Donnie, had a little store right next to, uh, right next to the house at a cafe. At a cafe. And I was going to mention that because the I, I wish I had this sign, you know, you, thinking back in memory. But there was a sign right on the outside of the, that probably Samuel Davis painted because because who was going to paint it besides Samuel Davis? Okay. Samuel Davis probably painted a sign, and it was a picture of a shrimp burger, and it had up top of it, shrimp burger, 50 cent. <laughs> that was the good old days, wasn't it? Shrimp burger, 50 cent. I bet they weren't imported shrimp either. I'll just say that. They were pretty good. So, Yeah. But anyway, uh, she called Daddy. He showed up, spotlight. And uh, well, my granddaddy had a 22 pistol, a little Ruger, Matter of fact, he, uh, Daddy could tell you the history of it, but he traded somebody like Samuel Guthrie. Anyway, he had, but he kept that in his store. That was his life insurance policy for the, for the store was that twenty two pistol. When Daddy had that twenty two pistol, flashlight, you know, done the D with the possum. Shine the light on the possum. He's going crazy. Shine the light on him. What does the possum do? He laid that right steel, shot the possum. Possum problem over, right? <laughs> Well, to, to get rid of that possum, um, that night they d decided they weren't going to go to the shore and get rid of it. Decided that they were going to uh, throw it in this here wash tub in the yard. So they throw that possum in the wash tub. Next morning she goes out there to kind of get rid of the possum, and there's a load of scratching all over that their bucket. And I know this is uh, this is my story, and it's kind of gruesome, but that's just the way it is. This was Grandma and the possum story. Scratching and and what what possum did they end up shooting? The mama possum and the mama possum what what do they have in the little pouches? The baby possums had got loose all you know they were everywhere you know trying to get out of that bucket you know grandma she's not she's not feeling sorry for those possums they've aggravated her the last six months you ooh and ah you weren't there <laughs> she's aggravated with those possums she's mad with the whole family. I told you Louie was involved in, in, this pot, in this story here. She goes down to the landing with that bucket. I know Grandma started church, and I believe Grandma made it to heaven. This day here was the, probably the closest day she came to sin in ever. <laughs> she got out along that shore, and she took every one of them little possums, and she threw them just as far as she could throw them in the sand. Right there in the back sand, she threw them. I don't know, eight or ten, far she go. What did they do? They swim in back to shore! <laughs> here they come swimming back to shore. I told you Louie was in here. 
Louie had a skiff right there with one of them big, long oars that he had hewned out of a nice piece of wood with no knots in it. <laughs> as, as, as if, or, as if our possum, I heard what you say, you know, Ash, well, yeah, yeah, as if possums got close enough, Grandma, <laughs> like whack-a-mole, <laughs> end of the possum story, Grandma's possum's problems were solved finally, after, in, in, in uh, what do you say, uh, thanks to Mr. Louis Orr, so that's a true, that's a true story, Grandma and the possum. <laughs> So good for grandma, huh? For grandma. Don't mess up with grandma now. I'm telling you, grandma yeah, stuff. Yeah. I was teaching at East Carter High School. It was, and it wasn't. It wasn't Tom, so don't worry. <laughs> but Tom was in my class, though. So it was a uh, Heath Stewart, a boy from South River, one day, and I, you know, to get my goal was always get as a little boy get about twenty robins, and that was a good stew with some rutabagas and you know a little pastry bread all. You know, right in the top of it, it'll bubbling right pretty at the end. But uh, one day I, I looked at, I said, does, does anybody in Robin Hunt and Heath from Cypher River? He said, I do. He said, I, I said, I'll give you a dollar bird if you'll bring me about 20 in a bag. And it wasn't about a week later, he brought me a little Ziploc bag with 20 Robins in it right there at East Carter. Look, <laughs> back, and, and I was, I'm caught as an as a, as a educator, I was caught between the old way and this, and this now shooting, you know, guns in schools. And I mean, it's crazy stuff now, the things that go on. And it's, I mean, and I tell people this story. Bobby Vaughn Hancock and I, when we were in, if you want to call it middle school in Harkers Island, in the spring of the year, we stood at the bus stop with shotguns trying to shoot a loon flying over. <laughs> Today, can you imagine standing to a bus stop with shotguns? What they would do to you? We went to school with I them mean, in the back, in the back class where up Yeah, the I mean, you know, so. That evening was going to go hunt. Yeah, yeah. You didn't, you didn't dare think about shooting up people on the bus. Yeah, and people would ride by, they'd roll the window down. I say roll the window down. It wasn't no button, you know. <laughs> roll the window down. You got one this morning? You seen anything? No, they always too high there where we lived. But no, we hadn't done that. Now, Chris, how did you clean the robin? How did you get that press after? Uh, uh, I rock, here's what I did, and I, yeah, I mean, if you if you take him and you know lay him down face to you, and you know where the breast bone is there, if you take your two thumbs and you just kind of peel it apart, it will come right apart. It's that tender, and then, and then you reach under his breastplate, you pull it up, and then they're they're so tender. Most times you don't even have to clip the wings; you can just kind of pull them right out. And that's about all there is to it. It's just that that little breast, but you can breast that breast that out. Try to pick them that way. Yeah, I always like the breast. Even like duck hunting now, I'm a I'm a I'm a breast man. Don't take that wrong. <laughs> well, uh, my the rutabagas is good, and some onions and potatoes. I'm, I'm just saying, it's hard to beat that. <laughs>